does Big Brother see while he is watching? Simon Menna is talking to you about this. Um, uncovering images from the secret Stasi ar archives. He was born 1978 in southern Germany and now he lives and works in Berlin. Um, he does a lot of stuff with uh, photography and history and he has been researching three years in Stasi files and images and he is going to show us why this is still relevant today or even maybe more relevant than ever. Give him a warm welcome. Thank you. So I was, I was told to use this um, other than the lavalier mic, so I hope it works. Um, first, a disclaimer, I'm an artist. Uh, I'm not an historian, so my approach to the material I'm going to show you is somewhat different from what you might expect from, an, uh, from a regular historian. Um, but we can discuss this as we go on. Um, and very, very briefly, before I'm going to show you images I found at the archive of the Stasi and some very few archive I found at the archive of the BND, um, I'm going to show you three bodies of work that brought me to my interest in the Stasi files. Because, so, um, I, I'm a trained artist, I'm a photographer, and normally I'm doing things like this. And I'm very interested in um, the, relation, uh, the, the relationship of perception, uh, or what perception does within uh, the context of modern conflict. And um, it turns out more and more importantly, um, perception is a battlefield and um, fear is a weapon. And this is actually uh, not just a set of landscape images, it's actually a, a set of photographs for which I had the support by the German army. They supported me with snipers. Um, they were hiding in the landscape and aiming at the camera and therefore at the viewer, um, which is okay, of course. Um, so the, the sniper would be here. And in most of the pictures from this series, um, there's actually almost no trace to be seen from a sniper. But this is the way a sniper looks within the landscape. So they were um, ordered to aim at me even though I couldn't see them. So sometimes when they were posing, I told them, well, just don't hide behind a tree and I don't see you. And they told me, no, no, um, don't worry, we are aiming at you. So, <laughs> and um, of course the whole thing is artificial because they wouldn't, would never choose this kind of setting and this kind of environment for their, uh, to pose the threat. There's a sniper here or there's a sniper here. But this is something that really, plays an important role in today's conflicts that you try to occupy your opponent's mind and um, influence his or her behavior in that way through creating fear. That's another set of images. Um, it's based on uh, handbooks by the US Army on how to construct booby traps out of, out of ordinary objects. Like here, a TV set or radio, if you switch it on, um, it blows up a box or a pipe. As an artist, I find this image very in intriguing because there's this one very famous painting by Magritte. This is not a pipe. Actually, this is not a pipe, even though it's, it's supposed to look like a pipe. So, but be aware, that's from the 60s, from the US Army. And these handbooks are now out there and used by the opposing forces, uh, by forces they encounter. And the whole story behind these, um, these manuals is, well, you're supposed to create fear in your opponent. Um, here's a German chocolate bar. If you break it off, it blows up in your face. Or a tea kettle. So the, the thing, so the, the more ordinary objects are, the more terrifying it becomes, because once you realize that there's no way for you to avoid the, the, this idea of fear, um, everything is dangerous. Um, of course, the other side does this as well. This is um, from, from videos I found online. This is the last video frame before the blast. So the last video frame before a car bomb or roadside bomb or something, something like this explodes. And um, the same is here. So it's the same technique. And um, the, more I was the more research I did on this, this big topic of fear and perception within conflicts, started to 
think more and more about the topic of surveillance because the interesting aspect would be to look at images from of surveillance because that would sh show us this, these mechanisms, mechanisms from the other side. But the strange thing is uh, we talk so much about surveillance and much, much uh, what we talk about is image-based. So Big Brother is watching you. That has something to do with images. But we take it for granted that there's nothing for us to see. Big Brother is watching us, but this hidden behind some curtains. But I came to realize that actually with the very unique history of Germany, we have this huge opportunity in the Stasi archives that are accessible to the public um, to do, try to show what Big Brother actually sees. And I um, approached them because I could only find written references to images they have. And I asked him, but, well, I could never find images. So do these still exist? And they told me, yeah, sure, come over. And that was the start of a three-year or lengthy uh, research project. And first, I'm going to show you images I'm, I was then, uh, in the end, not really interested in. Images we know exist. So from now on, that's authentic Stasi material. Um, there are some from the Czech Republic, uh, Czech uh, GSSR. I'm going to point them out, and in the end, there are some from a BND. I point those out as well. That is something we expect to see, it's like shots taken through buttonholes and surveillance in the streets, or that's the US Embassy in East Berlin and the um, entrance doors were all on constant, under constant surveillance with photo uh, cameras and video cameras. But be aware, in the 80s, the, the video equipment was not that sophisticated, so at nighttime, the Stasi did record eight hours of darkness, but it still ended up at the files. So that's a, that's a um, state of mind we're talking about, so everyone was photographed. And then we have, quite often you find post boxes where each and every one who's posting a letter is photographed, no matter who he or she is, even if it's an elderly lady. Remember these images because I'm going to reference to them later. I was more interested in something like this. So the internal view. So, and now I'm, I, I, two years ago, roughly two years ago, I was able to publish a book. And now I'm going to somewhat follow the, the structure within the book because I was really interested in how do you become a spy. And I uh, encountered a lot of material that was meant for training purposes. These images are from a training session on how to disguise yourself as regular citizens. <laughs> Which I found, find quite strange, because normally that's nothing you should, be t should, should have to learn. But still, and then you have a, a soldier, and so it's, it's these ordinary, ordinary citizens. Um, some of them look like they live now in, in Berlin and uh, amongst the hipsters like this one. <laughs> <coughs> that was entitled Western Tourist. <laughs> Another tourist, like the photographer. So the Stasi photographs something that tries to look like a photographer. Um, so women work for the Stasi as well. And uh, so f the same thing. So disguising manuals. So what do you need to dress up like this and in what circumstance would you use something like this? He looks like from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I think. Um, <clears throat> but be, be aware that that's not meant to be funny. That was not meant to be seen by any one of you or me. That, that, that was meant to train agents. And we um, are going to see later that um, that was actually used. Here we have a hitchhiker at a motorway around Berlin. And that's from the uh, Jesus R archives, which I um, was granted access earlier this year. They did the same thing. So it's not, it's not just something the Stasi did. Um, they did it as well. And then you had um, other certain aspects of um, disguise, like how to wear a wig, um, or how to stick a fake mustache. For um, privacy, due to privacy concerns, the, um, the images had to be pixeled. But I could see the faces while researching the archives. It was much funnier, actually. So to stick fake mustaches. And then, uh, again, from the uh, Jesus R, 
you could also disguise cars. Like you could draw something that's from a from a steel mill in the uh, in the GSSR, and so and then uh, a dis in a way a disguised um, stroller with a camera, with a video camera, and that's actually a, one, a video camera from from Japan, and they imported this uh, type of surveillance equipment quite frequently. Sony. Um, and then you, you encounter other material like how to transmit secret signals and how to uh, transmit codes. The codes are not known now, but still the, the photos exist and they, they have a strange beauty in them. And then um, once, you, once you got your training and then you had to be taught how to maybe to arrest someone and then you first knock the door and then you you arrest him and uh, notice the, the piece of cloth on the floor because he didn't want to ruin his white shirt. <laughs> and maybe he wants to fight, so you have to fight. <laughs> <laughs> so, but the Stasi always wins. And um, again, the Jesus are, they, they took things very seriously. Things there seem to be escalating much quicker. Um, so you have to shoot people. Boo. And then again, it quickly escalates and he has to be shot. Um, and then now, when you know that, you have to uh, be taught how to, to follow people around. And this, sometimes you find these very elaborate stories where you follow people around. That's just a very short exception. Um, so she's at the bakery and then she goes to a doctor's office, which is already something Stasi maybe shouldn't know, but still, and then she does a phone call, and here you see she's smiling at the camera, of course, the whole thing is staged for the colleagues. Uh, but this sometimes is very lengthy. You see this guy shopping, and then shopping and walking the, at Alexanderplatz and meeting another guy, and it's like a photo love story in Bravo, really. It's <laughs> Like then they take the, take the car and he gets off the car in the middle of the woods and he walks and another car comes and then they meet and why do you take such pictures? What's the point of that? But still that ends up at the archive and um, is part of the, the training, training operation. So now the training is done and this then is a real uh, surveillance photograph. You see a black arrow that's supposedly the person they were shadowing. And then you see, okay, now we are not in the training manual again, um, but we are already one step ahead. And that's then the real, the real material. He or she is followed around the, the country. And then also again, uh, Czech Republic, you have like ordinary citizens being shadowed, entering a house. So, and, um, after the, uh, with the shadowing comes also the, the um, breach of privacy. And here we have the, the room of a teenager, which looks very innocent to us, but I'm very positive that, I guess it's Guy, he never entered university in East Germany, due to the fact that they could prove that he was a fan of Wiley Coyote and the United States, or so they thought they could prove. And they took such images as evidence for your thinking, which is a problem of a surveillance operation, I would argue. And then here we might have the, I don't know if you see it, that might be the biggest Madonna fan in all of communist Eastern Europe. <laughs> Same thing. Probably would never be able to study um, uh, law or medicine or something like that. And then you have frequently, sorry, Cover your eyes, maybe. Um, you have frequently you have images such as this, and that was classified as Western pornography. And the funny thing about these, this classification, very often you find files that read Western pornography, and the photographs are missing. <laughs> so, someone went to this apartment, documented everything, archived it, maybe. The, guy was prosecuted, and when no, was, no one was looking, they took the pictures. Which then shows the, the absurd nature of the, of the system. Then this 
for me, this is a very key image and it's a set of images, but this is actually the, uh, one of the images that brought me to um, contacting the Stasi archives. I read about those images. This is a Polaroid, as you can see by the white, white background. And as a matter of fact, the Stasi frequently purchased Polaroid films or confiscated Polaroid films sent to East Germany. And the reason for that was when they broke into people's homes and you should never find out, the easiest thing was you break in, you look around, what looks interesting, you take a Polaroid, and with, with the help of, of Polaroid, you are able to put everything back into the original position. So this is a, an absolute brutal image because that shows the deepest possible breach of private, privacy imaginable. And most people, in fact, never found out that their apartment was searched. And that was absolutely illegal, even in East Germany. And um, so it was very revealing. Last year, a German TV station thought it's a clever idea to bring me, hook me up with a former Stasi general. And he, I, I told him about the, the Polaroids, and he said, yeah, but uh, um, please keep in mind, I, I've, I never broke into people's apartments. I said, yeah, well, did you order it? Yes, I ordered it, but I never broke into people's houses. And I said, what stupid excuse is that? Who then is responsible? Because normally the excuse is always, I was ordered to do. And his excuse was, yeah, I just ordered them. I don't really, why would they do it? So see, I just <laughs> ordered it. I, it was not my intention. So, and so that really was revealing to me, like the state of mind within such a system. So you have um, for, um, folders and folders and folders of those Polaroids. And when they found something incriminating, they might have returned a few days later with the police and a search warrant because they needed a search warrant even in East Germany. So, and then now we, we realize that oh, that's, even though it looks funny the way they disguise themselves, it's meant seriously and it's a terrible, brutal system, which you also see in these images from the GSSR where people are forced to stage their own attempt of fleeing the country. So they, they were made to stage the thing they were arrested for. Even the young child was made to re reenact their failed attempt to flee the country. And that is brutal. And so sometimes you find images that are completely out of um, any category, <laughs> like a guinea pig. I told you earlier to think back of the, uh, remember the post box with the old lady. There's one, that's an image from one of those files. So you have a, a shot, uh, a surveillance operation of a post box. You see it's taken from a high angle and maybe out of a private apartment. And, my, and then you have this shot of the shot of the shot of the shot and two pictures of this guinea pig. And then the surveillance operation continues. And what I read out of that is he was in a, a private apartment and was bored. And there, they ran this guinea pig, and he lies flat on the ground, takes two shots, and then continues the surveillance operation, knowing that the material is going to end up at the archive, and gets his archive number. That's German bureaucracy, I guess. <laughs> um, so, very revealing. So, who are these guys? That's actually a British spy. That's, there were some officially regis registered Western spies within Eastern Germany. The Russians had the same thing for West Germany. And the Stasi's job was to sh follow them and document what they were doing. They couldn't do anything to them. They only could document it. And you find many of these images, like a spy taking a picture of a spy in an endless circle <laughs> of surveillance. And what's very revealing is the fact that I tried to gain access to the their material, it's still classified. <laughs> I, I'm very positive I know what the image shows. It's pretty much the same thing. <laughs> but so I try to, to understand what these people are thinking, but it turns out even though they were fighting each other, they seem to share a very common state of mind. <laughs> but so that looks like um, the end point of surveillance. No, it's not. It's one step further is 
Stasi agents watching Stasi agents watching other people. That's a triangle of surveillance. Yeah? So common as well. Just don't, never be sure about your colleagues. They could be up to something. So better spy on them as well. But then I, I present you the absolute high point and end point of surveillance, which is the surveillance selfie. <laughs> I give you another one. Um, they knew it's going to end up at the archive. So they're spying on themselves while spying on others while spying on themselves. So it's this, it's almost meditative. Um, so now, who are these people? Now we're really at the internal view. The Stasi looks at itself. Here's a group photo. Remember this guy, we encounter him later. That happens to be the um, phone surveillance unit. Um, highest ranking officials here, that's the boss of the whole bunch. And of course the Stasi, East, Eastern Europe, they like their medals and then an award ceremony, flowers, a medal, piece of paper. And there's this guy from the phone surveillance unit, again. So he gets really shabby flowers <laughs> and piece of paper. That's odd. See, see this? It's a wax seal and it's burned at the side because he was knighted and knighted as a knight of the phone surveillance <laughs> unit. Um, see this? Um, to the, to the non-Germans, that's an aberration symbol for a code of law in Germany. Outside Germany, that's not widely used. He knew that they were breaking the law. And they're mocking it. They're mocking it with this ceremony. So now here, you are the knight of the phone surveillance unit. Congratulations. Ha, ha, ha. What a good joke. Another set of images, which is very revealing, is this. Strange, strange finding in the Stasi archive. A strange combination. See, the bishop and a soccer player, and back there with the blue shirt, that's a, that's a party youth member, and then they, see the ballerina there? Strange. The guy in the suit, it's his birthday, and he's the boss of them. He's a, one of, these are all highest ranking Stasi officials. And they surprise him with a birthday party. And the surprise is to dress up as those people you put under surveillance. <laughs> so see, um, party youth, soccer player, another soccer player, the ballerina, beautiful, very beautiful. Soccer fan, of course, you have to put them under surveillance. A doctor, of course, who cares about the um, right to be quiet. Um, uh, of doctors, a judge. Of course, you have to put the judges under surveillance. And then that is an, a dis, a disguise or dress up, hardly to be understood outside Germany. He's dressed, uh, dressed up as a peace activist. And he, he wears this swords to plowshares, Schwerter zu Pflugscharen sticker at his head and uh, some other peace stickers there. And he is very proud of himself. Why is that? Because it was such a successful, successful costume. I think, where, where did he get the costume from? The, the easiest thing for someone like him would be to take it from someone they put in jail. Because you could at least lose access to university for wearing this, one of these stickers, at least. Or you could serve some short time, but some time in jail. You could lose access to good housing and everything. Why is he able to mock it? Because he's the one who would decide whether or not you lose access. And this is the, this is the terrible thing about these images. They're very revealing. I, I'm very fast, I'm sorry. Um, so, the, the, what, so these images are now, what, 25, 30 years old. 
Why do I think these images are still relevant today? It's because of something like this. There was a short period after the fall of the Berlin Wall. So the, the wall fell in um, uh, November 9th, and the Stasi wasn't dissolved till early January. So there was a very short period of time where the Stasi could actually try to destroy material. They managed to do destroy a huge bunch of material, not very um, important set, except for an espionage that's almost gone. Um, but if it would have been up to them, that would have been the fate of all these images. Destruction. We would have never been able to look at these images. And even though we don't know what these images stand for, maybe he, that's, a, that's a group of gay men and they tr infiltrated it and it was compromising to one of their colleagues that they infiltrated it. They did things like that. But they tried to destroy it. So 25 years after the fall of the Berlin Wall, even more now, why do you still, still think this material is very relevant? I'm going to show you something, uh, something that's even more special and more rare than the material I showed you just now. It's this. Over the course of approximately a year, I tried to convince uh, um, BND to grant me access to their material. Which would be amazing because in Germany we have this one society with the two opposing systems. So the view on the Cold War would be absolutely astonishing if we would be, would be able to look at all the material. And after a year they uh, got a call and just told me, yeah, we got something for you, come over. There was actually, they have a small, relatively small section in Berlin, so I went there with my scanner and so, and they gave me the, I would call them 14 most boring pictures of um, the BND history. <laughs> it's a matchbox. This. And that. And when I looked at these images, I was like, are you kidding me? What, what, what do they show? And this guy was very serious and told me, unfortunately, I can't tell you because the information is still classified. <laughs> But back then, he told me, yeah, as far as he knows, these are the only images they ever released. <laughs> and yeah, toothpaste. So there's a huge problem I have with this, of course. Um, not with this young lady in particular, but in general, the, these images. They can decide which images to show. And one of the guys I was in contact with there, he told me, of course we have these disguise pictures and dress up and things like that. But keep in mind, even though he, back then he might have been the lowest in the hierarchy and now he might be head ahead of the department or the one who brought in the, the guy who's now the head of the department. Of course it's not in their interest for these images to be released. Yeah, and then <laughs> I think, who, well, but it's in my interest and in our interest for us to decide which images are worth looking at or not. And there's another problem with images like, like this. We have almost nothing that is accessible from the Western archives. This is rare, this is very special. It looks like shit, but it's very special. But we have a trove from the Eastern archives and um, there's always like the, the Merkel and everyone when when one of the Eastern former former communist countries decides well we should limit access to our former Stalinist archives they say oh, no don't do that it must be open but what happens when we have access to just one side and see all the terrible things they are doing and have no access to the other side I'm not saying that the BND did the same terrible things the Stasi did, but the BND was certainly breaking our laws as well. And so, but it does look more innocent because we only have access to a very terrible looking archive. And if you look to, to West Germany, it's like nothing there, must be fine. And that's a, that's a terrible thing. And that's, there's a lot wrong with that. Yeah. 
So I'm almost, almost at the end. I was rushing through. Oh, sorry. But um, so um, I, I can show you two. Well, just from the from the uh, just because I was too quick from the from the Czech archive, um, two videos. Audio isn't important. Oh, sorry. Maybe that is not going to work. It seemed things escalated much quicker in in the GSR than. Oops, sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, life in the GSR must have been very dangerous. He has weapons everywhere. the best thing comes now. <laughs> Who would carry <laughs> something like that there? Or <laughs> and just if you wonder how, that's a very long film. That's just a abs, um, short part of it. If you're ever attacked by someone with a chair. <laughs> nee, das ist nicht wichtig. Das Audio ist ganz furchtbar. <laughs> so th that's like the sixth or seventh time he shows that. And now he shows it again. And then it's going to be used. But look closely how it's used, the technique they just learned. So yeah? So, okay, do, do this the next time you're attacked by someone with a chair. <laughs> yeah, so, okay. Now he's going to be attacked by a chair. Watch careful, he implements it quite properly. <laughs> ah. Well, he didn't, didn't really look. And things always, there's a long film and always escalates very quickly. <laughs> and then, here is the, the most, un, uh, two very long shots, and you are supposed to spot them, that are unnecessarily long. <laughs> so of course they find the black guy smuggling. <laughs> and he explains him now in English, well, do you have more like that or so? And he says, no, 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 no. And still, the, the porn is still in the shot, you know? And then he tells him, yeah, but it's going to be very serious if you don't confess now. And the black guy says, no, I don't have anything to confess. And now the, the guy on the left gets suspicious there. He said, look at him. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, it's very suspicious, this black young man. He doesn't want to sign his confession, so. Yeah, he gets suspicious. <laughs> very, very, very suspicious. <laughs> very suspicious. And fortunately, the cameraman made the move to the left, so not to zoom in on the, on the penis. No, no, he doesn't have anything. So, but it turns, out, it turns out he has something, because he's black and suspicious looking. You know? See? Ah, ah, oh, he's moving his arm. Yeah, yeah.
So it turns out his arm is not broken. And sorry, that was somewhat long, but I rushed through everything else so quickly. But um, for some reason, he hides batteries <laughs> in his cast. <laughs> Um, so, he, well, you couldn't hide that. It's a, you could bring in the watches, but you better hide the batteries, you know, that because that's, woo. Um, so, yeah, any questions? Thank you. Maybe I, I hope you got what you paid for. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe before we start the questions and answers, everybody, everybody who wants to leave, leave now. We, we're, we're going oh, to take one fun. minute so that you can leave and all the others who want to stay have it quiet for the Q&A. And remember to, you know, use oh, the rating system. Oh, um, I, I brought postcards <laughs> if you want both. <laughs> because uh, we have to make fun of them as much as we can. I feel like the star. <laughs> it's all the same motif, but take as many as you want, if you want any. Thank you. Uh, with the microphone, I guess. There are two microphones for the questions and answers. No, four even, if you need them. One, two, and we have questions from the internet. Five seconds. Okay, so we will start with you. Yes, just a uh, short question, please. Uh, first of all, thanks for the wonderful talk. It was very, very interesting. Um, can you give us the title of your book, please? Oh, yeah, it's pretty much um, top. So Google my name, or it's available in your local bookstore, or if you want, Amazon. It's still, it's still available, but um, not that many copies left, so you should all get it as soon as possible. <laughs> Um, it's just top secret, and then Simon Menner, or just Menner. My family doesn't write that many books. <laughs> Thank you. Over here. Um, would you be so kind to uh, give uh, to show us back that photo with the coyote ugly and American flag? Because I thought I saw Yugoslav air transport um, logo on the yes yacht. There you see it. Oh, yeah, here. He flew with, uh, now it's called Air Serbia, huh. but uh, yeah. That must have been the reason, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, it, yeah, yeah. it must have. I just wanted to check that out. Thanks. <laughs> sure. <laughs> we have a question from the internet. Um, yes, Frankie, too, is asking how does this compare to today's surveillance? The problem is, in a way, that's a treasure trove but it's a very weird one. If I could decide, uh, freely choose what material to look at, I would definitely look, try to look at the last two weeks of NSA surveillance, like we all would. But that is as close, and unfortunately, that is as close as, po um, as we can get to this kind of material. And, but keep in mind, back in its days, the Stasi was as sophisticated, at least as sophisticated as the BND. They were, in fact, they were more advanced in the technologies they used. And the Stasi would definitely use the same techniques BND and CAA and everyone else uses today. They would try to listen in on our phone conversations. 
that might not be the right material to look at from a technological point of view, but I think this material is very interesting and important if you want to find something out about their state of mind, and um, which is absurd. And the, but keep in mind, so the excuse you hear from the NSA, they, they just want to protect the law, and that's why they're breaking the law. That's an excuse you regularly find with the Stasi as well. And you find parallels, and that's why I think it's very important to look at this material, even though it's very old. But back then, so in the, the, whole, the whole archive consists somewhere between one and two million photographs, which is absurdly little if you think that the, the system was in operation for almost 40 years. That's 50,000 pictures a year. They had 85,000 agents. And from today's standards, that's nothing. But today, they would be far more sophisticated, I guess. Thank you. We have a question over there. Is that a question? Yeah. Uh, so firstly, thank you for your talk. So you, you showed that some of this uh, archive information had been destroyed, or at least attempts were make, made to destroy mm -hmm. it, and much of it was, but there's, there was still a lot left for you to, to look through. Um, what happens in future generations when, uh, given that now surveillance is done all digitally, uh, you said that the Stasi had some number of weeks from when the, the, the wall fell to when they had yeah. to actually disband and I had time to, to, to destroy things. Given now how quickly and easy it is to erase digital information, uh, what, 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 do you, what do you say to the people coming after you in future generations who might want to try and find similar things in dissolved surveillance organizations? I mean, are they completely stuffed? Unless or? there's going to be a revolution, they are not going to be able to look at anything. That would be my guess. Because you need this abrupt shift in the whole system that pretty much decapitates this operation. And so they, they lost everything, and now it's frozen in time. And the, the guy at the BND told me, well, it's up to us to decide what we reveal and what not, because we have a veto. Of course, nothing is then revealed, ever. And so as long as this stays the policy, and it is the policy currently everywhere, from what I understand, um, you're not going to be able to look at anything. I'm not very optimistic in that respect. Neither am I. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. Thanks for your talk. How did you decide what faces to anonymize and which not to anonymize? And besides the, the Czech Republic archive, I, with the Czech images, I did it. Because um, with those images, and that's weird, you can do whatever you want, <laughs> which is terrible in a way. The Stasi images, the archive had to decide it, and they had to decide it on the basis um, once you, when you work for in an official position under German law, when you work in an official position in times of historical importance, like that, um, you lose your privacy rights. You don't share the same privacy rights. So once we could find written evidence that a person shown in the image was working for the Stasi, um, like him or her, um, they lost the right of privacy. If the slightest doubt remained, it had to be pixeled. So it wasn't done by me. So Thank German you. privacy rights are very strict. Thank you. Sure. Uh, just a quick, quick, quick question. Uh, you said when you talked about surveillance, uh, watching each other and surveilling each other, that this would be something like the highest state of surveillance. but. In a sense, don't you think there's now a much higher state and also that before things were much more clear, everybody knew that there was a regime trying to stay in power mm -hmm. and try to put down everybody to kick him off. But now, wouldn't it be a situation where they don't even have to break the law, they just make it legal to survey? We can see in France now with the law on intelligence that passed just after the Charlie murders, and now we've got the murders again, and you've got people that are have to stay in their home because the intelligence has said that they might protest and they don't have to go through a judge. So yeah. they're actually making it legal and not even have to break the law. And also no, we're at a stage it, where people it, actually surveil each other. It, it, that, that's Facebook today. Yeah, somehow. And the problem, <laughs> and the, 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 general, the general problem with surveillance operations, I would argue, and I hope that here's someone is here from the BND and they come forward and I give a talk to them because I would really like to find out. 
So please, my email was there. Um, the thing is, I would argue that this type of surveillance cannot work. What you're trying to find proof for is a state of mind, is thoughts, is not something you did, but some things you think about or you think of you might want to do. And for photography, I, I am a photographer. I know how bad photography is. You were looking at images of landscape where no sniper is visible and each one of you saw it. That's how bad photography is as an evidence. And this can be proof for everything and nothing. Could be proof. They don't need photography now. If you look what happened no, in they, France. They, they, they use just it. write a paper to the, to the prefet police and he just says, okay, they're dangerous and tells them you have to stay at home because yeah, there might but, be a protest. Yeah, but still they, f they need proof or evidence for they something don't. like that. It's Maybe just not. the intelligence but, service. But the Read weird the thing is now you, le you, you leave behind such a trail of evidence yourself that could be read somewhere in the future. What happens in 10 years when in the US, like with smoking, um, drinking isn't socially acceptable anymore? What happens to you then with your Facebook entry that's 20 years old then? <laughs> it's, a weird, it's a weird system. It's a, yeah, but. We have another question from the internet. Yes, um, somebody from the internet from IRC is asking if you have tried to contact other agencies. Yeah, like the BND, and with a, uh, which was not very successful, and with a, with these spies taking pictures of spies, I tried with the British archive. I know these pictures still exist. I know where they exist, but sorry. Um, and with the Czech uh, Republic, I was asked by the Goethe Institute to approach them, but it, that was very difficult. That's too lengthy to explain now. It was very difficult working with them language-wise and because of the structure of the archive itself. Um, but uh, they were very open. And so if you want to do more research on something like this, go to the Czech Republic first because it's much easier to work with them on a bureaucratic level than with, uh, with the Germans, but the Germans um, are in a way more organized. <laughs> well, that's the Germans. It's the Germans. Your question. Oh, no. How hard was it to, to get the material, although it's uh, not classified anymore? How much mm -hmm. time did you invest? So the, yeah. the, the hardest time was the waiting periods in between requests, because it's German bureaucracy takes forever. And I'm quite sure, I'm from West Germany, but now I have a very huge file in this archive, I think, because they, they compile everything. So they keep track of every p picture you're looking at. It is a, and it's, but the, the funny thing, it's, it's not hard at all. You can do it as well. You don't have to be a researcher. And the archive considers research a basic human right, which I learned then. And it's a very convenient thing. And there are some elderly former Stasi agents who spent their retirement researching something, something. They can do it. And, um, but the, and the weird thing was that um, most of the picture no one's looked at before. That could be proven because they keep track of everything. So, but it's very easy. It's, it's ve a very lengthy process, but very easy. Okay. When you decided to duck the archives, did you have to apply for a certain, well, for a certain corner in the archive, or could you just walk in and say, mm. show me all your pictures? No, 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 no. It was very, they were very open. They might have closed off behind me somewhat. <laughs> <laughs> because for them, it was, strangely overwhelming the amount of feedback they got after my book came out and they want to be left alone i think <laughs> so <laughs> in a way um you have to formulate it, it quite clearly and um what what exactly your, your no, aim uh, or what a you theme, want to look at a theme but for theme. me when, since this was new back then for them as well it was like um surveillance and photography, which is a very broad topic. Now they receive quite a few requests that stated, uh, we want to see what Simon Mena saw, and they don't accept something like this. So you have to come up with something more mm. clever. And how much time did you spend in their dungeons? Well, it took some three years on and off, but it's mostly waiting okay. in between. Yeah, but Thank so you. be patient if you want to do something <laughs> like you. that. 
Okay, your question. Um, modern state agencies, including the NSA and the BND, have this uh, mentality of collected all passive intelligence and mm. has this ability to uh, minimize the impact and the damage and have there's no human eyes, say, looking at specific pieces of surveillance. Uh, of course, we know that's not true. It's, um, and they can zero in when they want to. Uh, but this makes it very ch difficult, I think, to, as an archivist, how do you try to understand the state of mind uh, when you have so much data, possibly unprocessed data, and how do you get into the mind of uh, filtering through this bureaucratic censorship of not just no documents, but 100 million documents? Yeah, you have to be, you know, one has to be very careful with such material because you look through their eyes. And that's, that's, that can be dangerous. And that's why I try not to provide that much, quote, in quotes, background information. Because the background information on most of the images is text compiled by the Stasi agents themselves. So it's, there's already guilty or not guilty written in the text. And I don't want to look at these pictures through their eyes. But still, I find it very revealing to look at the, the raw material. And uh, the Stasi wouldn't, would, would have collected everything in bulk if they w would, would have been able. They opened every parcel to East Germany, every letter. And they were, once paranoia-wise, they were several steps ahead of the NSA. They had a university, and when you were studying there, you could do your PhD, but you were not allowed to keep your, the notes you t t um, took during the day. They had to be locked into lockers that had doors on two sides. So they, you locked them in, they were copied at night, and you were not allowed to keep your PhD thesis because the moment you wrote it, it was classified top, top secret. And that's paranoia. That really is paranoia. And, and so, yeah, I, 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 well, the thing is, I cannot prove it. And that's the problem with the whole thing that one side remains closed. You cannot prove otherwise. And um, they, they, I, I guess my guess would be they're quite happy with this situation that you cannot prove otherwise. Because like this, they can always say, no, we did something else. Well, we can't tell you, but not like this. And it's always very vague, but sta from a state of mind, I think it's the same. Over there. Yeah, what's actually the copyright of these pictures? Are they public domain? Can I use them for internet memes? Uh, no. Unfortunately, well, so most of the pictures are on my website in a low resolution, which the archive doesn't like, but it's there. The problem with the, there is a law that covers this archive. It's not part of the archive sphere in Germany. It has its own law, and the law was written early 90s by lawmakers. We all know them and love them. And they never thought about the fact that an artist might come along and show them. So the law covers publication. You are free, once you got access to the material by the archive, you are allowed to publicize it. Nothing else is stated. But you're not allowed to hand over the files. And uh, I had lengthy debates with the, with the archive what that could mean, because they said, well, when you have it on, the, on your website, that's you hand out the, the files. And I said, no, it's publicizing it. No, 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 no. I said, yeah, well, what's the difference? Uh, we don't really know, but the, uh, we, well, so, yeah. Tricky, tricky. And there's so much, so many people copied it from my website, so it's out there and gone, which I think is good. Um, having a look at my watch, I think we have one more question here and two here. So and, and I'm here the next three days, so look sorry. at me. Yes. I might not remember your faces, I'm but sorry. you might remember my bald head, so talk to me. We'll start here. Uh, were you able to access uh, files other than um, images, like audio recordings of the phone surveillance, for example? Ah, that's a very tr tricky thing. You could listen to those, but getting them is almost impossible because um, the, German privacy laws again, and their argument is, well, they could give you something. Because whenever you speak, you could reveal something private. And that's their argument, even though you might be Erich Honecker or Helmut Kohl or something like that, and, but still, it could be private, what you're saying. And that's why they could never release something, and you, you would never be allowed to release it stating that's Erich Honecker, because it could be private. 
So it's a somewhat strange law. But no one's going to change it any time any anymore. And the last question over here. Well, yeah, I'm a bit is interested where you always know what uh, is shown by the photographs because were they uh, captioned like spy spying on spy or d uh, thought you about an explanation by yourself? It's um, gazillions of kilometers of files and just a very few photographs. So there's always a huge amount of background information. And the greatest thing, and why I'm very, the people I'm absolutely thankful uh, towards are the, the, it was all only ladies working at the archive, uh, really at the archive, handing me the files and gave me copies. Because the, the most important thing, and that's the, the tr when, whenever you want to work with an archive, the, the trickiest part is how do you find something you don't know exists because you can't ask for. I d I, I'm really looking for, is there a birthday party uh, with them? You will never ask for something like this. Once, but once you've earned the trust of the people working at the archive, they provide you and provided me uh, with these images because they knew in what direction I was looking for material. And there was always, in most cases, there was background information. Um, Oh, I didn't include, there's a weird set of a swan, a dead swan, which I didn't include in the talk. There's this, the famous, it's a set of four images of a dead swan. It was, it's only known that it was found in the vault that was owned by Erich Mirke, the head of Stasi personally. It's four images of a grave of, the, of a dead swan with a GDR flag around it. And that's very famous for being the biggest mystery in the Stasi files because nothing can be found about these images. So I didn't include them in the talk, so sorry. But it's a dead, dead swan, it's very mysterious, must have been important. <laughs> so thank you, Simon, very, very much. Thank you.